Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Barbara Barreno Paschal, and I'm a senior staff attorney with the Housing Opportunity Project of Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. My name is Mary Jo Noriega. I'm the Fair Housing Testing Coordinator. And we are here today to present the webinar, Fair Housing Laws for Chicago Housing Providers. We would like to thank the Chicago Commission on Human Relations and ALEO, Illinois Legal Aid Online, for supporting this event. We'll start by providing an overview of Chicago Lawyers Committee, and then we will provide an overview of the fair housing laws as they relate to housing providers in the Chicago land region. Then we'll briefly discuss legal developments that have occurred recently and answer questions. You may submit questions through the questions field, and we will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. So please hold your, you can submit your questions at any time, but we will answer them at the end of the presentation. First, we'll start with an overview of Chicago Lawyers Committee. The Chicago Lawyers Committee has the following mission statement. We are civil rights lawyers and advocates working to secure racial equ equity and economic opportunity for all. We provide pro bono legal representation through partnerships with the private bar and collaborate with grassroots organizations and other advocacy groups to implement community-based solutions that advance civil rights. You can find more information about our organization at www.clccrul.org. We also have Facebook and Twitter. Now we'll start with an overview of the fair housing laws. The importance of fair housing. Um, fair housing increases housing opportunities for all. Uh, housing plays a large role in defining a person's quality of life. Where you live affects your access to community services such as transportation, employment, schools, retail, where you shop. Um, the laws that the Fair Housing Act fall under are first the Federal Fair Housing Act that covers most of the housing in the United States. Uh, the agency that oversees it is the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD. The Illinois Human Rights Act covers most housing in Illinois. Uh, agencies are the Illinois Department of Human Rights and the Illinois Human Rights Commission. The Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance covers nearly all housing um, and that is the City of Chicago Commission on Human Relations. Cook County Human Rights Ordinance covers most housing in the Cook County area and that is the agency is Cook County Commission on Human Rights. So the overview of protected classes that fall under these laws are the Fair Housing Act of 1968. It bans housing discrimination on the basis of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, or disability. The, the Illinois Human Rights Act identifies additional protected classes, including sexual orientation, gender identity, age, 40 and above, marital status, order of protection status, ancestry, military status, or unfavorable military discharge. The local fair housing laws, the human rights ordinances, many counties and municipalities have also identified additional protected classes. Um, so it's best to check on those local ordinance in the community that you live in. So, when we think of a fair housing violation, it has to have two parts. The person has to be part of a protected class and a prohibited act regarding housing has to be committed. And that and then it would be called a fair housing violation. So some of the prohibited acts, refusing to sell or rent a dwelling after the making of a bona fide offer, if you refuse to sell or rent and you do that refusal is because of the fact of their race, uh, the fact they have children or any of these protected classes, um, then it would be considered a violation of the act. Refusing to negotiate for the sale or rental of a dwelling, discriminating in terms, conditions or privileges in the sale or rental of a dwelling, discriminating in the services of facilities in connection with the sale or rental of a dwelling. And the um, act also covers discriminating in lending or appraising. 
also included to make or print or publish a notice statement or advertisement that indicates a preference, a limitation or discrimination um, would be a violation. Misrepresenting the availability of property, that can be done uh, if someone were to just say it, it isn't available when it is. Steering, that has to do with steering to specific locations, possibly based on being part of a protected class, like this building is for families only, um, or this floor is for families only. Refusing to allow reasonable accommodations for persons with disabilities. Uh, certain things may be required for someone with a disability to be on the same footing in attaining housing. Um, so a refusal of that would be a violation of the Fair Housing Act. Retaliating against someone for exercising their fair housing rights. So, and retaliation can be many forms. If someone were to file a complaint with one of the agencies, and following the filing of the complaint, they received a, a notice that um, their housing was going to be terminated. That could be considered retaliation and they are protected. I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about source of income discrimination because this is a protected class under the Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance and the Cook County Human Rights Ordinance. The definition of source of income is any lawful manner by which a person supports himself or herself and his or her dependents through the use of the following. And this is an, a list that may not be exhaustive, but here are some examples. Child support, alimony, temporary assistance for needy families or TANF or public aid, food stamps, SSI benefits, unemployment compensation, Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Certificate or VASH, and housing choice vouchers, also known as Section 8 vouchers. These are all examples of sources of income that are covered under these ordinances. This law applies to any person, corporation, or firm selling or leasing any housing in Chicago. Here are some examples of statements that have been made by agents or landlords who have refused to rent to housing choice voucher or Section 8 recipients. This again is not an exhaustive list, it's just some examples that can be helpful. The first is you must earn three times the total rent amount to live in our building. That statement would essentially prevent people who have vouchers from living in certain buildings that are very high cost to rent in Chicago. For example, if a building has a rent of 20 or $2,000 a month, making three times that would imply that the person needs to make 6,000 a month or 72,000 a year in order to be able to rent in that building. Many housing choice voucher recipients do not make that income or they wouldn't be eligible for the voucher. So that type of policy applied as in a blanket fashion to anyone who has a voucher would necessarily be discriminatory because it would eliminate their consideration as a potential tenant. Another comment is our building is not set up to accept a housing voucher or the building is old and would not pass the inspection process. Even though the inspection process can take some time and there may be a fail at, on the first occasion, it is unlawful to prevent someone from renting on the basis that the inspection process for a housing choice voucher recipient would take too long or there would be a fail. So not allowing that opportunity, the inspection process to continue or begin would be seen as a violation of the Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance or the Cook County Human Rights Ordinance. Another statement is the man who owns the building lives out of the country and does not have time to go through the housing choice voucher process. And besides, he doesn't speak English. So even if the owner of a building may not live in the city of Chicago or Cook County, or even in the state of Illinois or the United States, the fact that that person rents to people in Chicago and has chosen to rent a building, purchase a building, whatever it is, they're covered under the act. And whether they speak English or not, they do need to follow the provisions of the act. And so a statement like that involving what would be known as an out of town landlord still could be discriminatory, even if the person is not physically present or does not speak English. Here are a few more facts about the housing choice voucher program that may be useful to know. In addition to the Chicago Housing Authority, the Housing Authority of Cook County, also known as HAC, also administers an HCV program in suburban Cook County. 
there is no such thing as an approved list of buildings that accept housing choice vouchers. It is true that there is a process that people who are new to the housing choice voucher program need to complete in order for the unit to be rented to a housing choice voucher tenant, but there is no such thing as an approved list. There are websites out there like Go Section 8 and others which offer units that already have owners who participate in the program, but just because a unit has not participated before doesn't mean that a person with a voucher can't live there. In addition, land, landlords who rent to housing choice voucher holders in opportunity areas, now referred to as mobility areas as of March 1st, 2018, can receive an additional lump sum payment equal to one month's rent. And this is part of the landlord incentive payment program. This is something that was launched in June of 2017 and applies to any landlords who lease units or rent units in the Chicago area that is in a mobility area. And the Chicago Housing Authority's website has more information about what those mobility areas are. This memorandum that you see on your screen was from 2013 by the Cook County Department on Human Rights and Ethics. It's a memorandum regarding source of income protections. And this memorandum contains some helpful guidance on what landlords and property managers should and should not do, so do's and don'ts, with respect to renting property when voucher holders are involved. So there are a few examples listed there about saying that you should not, for example, say you don't advertise to Section 8 or Housing Choice Voucher Holders. And it is impermissible to treat voucher holders differently from people who don't have voucher holders or who don't have vouchers. And then also considering the portion of the rent that the voucher holder would pay. So with the subsidy, the local housing authority pays a portion of the rent and the voucher holder pays the remaining portion. So it's important for housing providers to consider the portion the renter can pay, not the overall rent amount when determining the income limits in reference to what I was saying earlier about the three times the rent. So this is a helpful memorandum that is available at the Cook County Department of Human Rights and Ethics website. Now moving on, Mary Jo will continue with the remainder of the overview section of this presentation. Beginning with national origin, uh, a protected class. National origin means the place in which a person or one of his or her ancestors was born. Being of a particular national origin means that a person has or is perceived to have the physical, cultural, and linguistic characteristics of a particular national origin group. I think that example of perceived to have is very important. Um, they don't have to be from another country, but if your perception of them based on their name or based on their skin color leads you to believe that, it still can be a claim. So examples of discrimination would be property owners, um, which we have seen many property owners saying, I rent to people who are of my same culture. If you specifically do that, that too can be in violation because you are choosing only to rent and your reasoning may be because I can communicate with them. Um, that would be a violation. So when renting and leasing to immigrants or persons from another national origin, uh, if you're gonna inquire about immigration status you must do so for all of your applicants. It's illegal to require more documentation or fees to immigrants. If a prospective tenant brings along an interpreter uh, and the agent, landlord, or realty must negotiate and work with them. Families with children is another area where discrimination can occur uh, particularly in occupancy restrictions. The HUD general rule of thumb is two people per bedroom, but children under two do not count in that equation. And also depending on the square footage of rooms, it may be appropriate for a family of five to be in a two bedroom where the children have bunk beds and maybe a crib for a child under age of two. Steering. Steering designated buildings or certain floors to only families with children and different terms and conditions. If you apply different rules or policies to families with children, that can be considered familial status um, um, 
discrimination. Disability. The definition of disability under the Federal Fair Housing Act is a person has a disability if he or she has a physical or a mental impairment or psychological impairment or a record exists of such impairment and this impairment limits one or more life activities, major life activities, like their ability to hear, see, ability to walk. This includes, of course, people who use wheelchairs, those who are hearing or visually impaired, and also people with AIDS and HIV and who are obese. People recovering from alcohol or drug abuse are also covered, and the key word is recovering here. Under the Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance, the definition of disability is a little bit different. Uh, disability means a determinable, a determinable physical or mental characteristic which may result from disease, injury, congenital condition of birth, or functional disorder, including, but not limited to, a determinable physical characteristic which necessitates a person's use of a guide, hearing, or support dog, or the history of such a characteristic, or the perception of such a characteristic by the, um, by the person who's going to be rented to them. So some of the prohibited acts in regards to persons with disabilities would be a refusal to permit, usually at the expense of the renter, reasonable housing modifications necessary for the daily life of a person with a mental or physical disability. Refusal to provide for effective communication as needed for persons with disabilities. I can think of some cases, for instance, uh, condominiums where someone who is deaf may require uh, another way to be part of uh, monthly meetings where they might ask, can we bring in an interpreter? Um, this may occur during the rental process or during the process while they are living at the location. And another area, refuse to reasonably accommodate or adjust rules, policies, services, or practices as reasonably requested by a person with a physical or mental disability. Um, this could be things as you have a no pet policy. Um, the person requires the dog based on either sight, may assist in hearing, or might be an emotional support dog. Uh, so that policy can be changed based on, on that. Uh, practices as reasonably requested by a person with a physical or mental disability. Uh, so the other things, the rules are parking. I know that brings up a lot of questions. So say you have a first come first serve parking lot and someone you're going to be renting to uses a van that has a lift well, those parking spaces would not work for them. So they don't need special treatment. They just need something that will work for them to give them the same service as someone who doesn't have a disability would receive. Harass someone on the basis of a protected class or retaliate against them. So if on the basis of requesting a reasonable accommodation or a modification, if they were to retaliate in any way or, or uh, send a notice that they were not going to renew their lease, that would be considered possibly a retaliation against them for exercising their fair housing rights. So what is a reasonable accommodation and modification? So components, usually a disability in some form is present. Could be an invisible disability, it could be one that's readily you can see with your eyes. Uh, a modification or accommodation might be needed. Usually what's needed is a relationship or nexus between the request and what the person's disability is. And this can usually be applied if necessary, uh, or a doctor can give a form requesting why a accommodation or modification is needed if that's necessary. If it's an obvious disability, that may not be necessary. 
uh, manner and time of request. That can be made anytime. It could make, be made, the request can be made before moving in, during the time they're moving in, or during the time that they are living there. It can be done by verbally talking about their need, or it can be done by giving a letter. Uh, we recommend a letter. A letter is always nice because you've got uh, the time that it's given. And um, if, if then there isn't a response to that accommodation request or modification request, it would be considered a refusal. So what's expected on the part of a landlord or someone who rents to someone with a disability is to engage in an interactive process with them and give them a timely response. Maybe what they ask for might not be what you can, what you do, but you might have by interacting and realize that there is another option that maybe might cost less, but it would still provide what is needed. Um, so engaging in the interactive process is, is something that should occur. Reasonable modifications. Examples of these are grab bars, wall reinforcements, ramps, cabinets lowered or removed, door frames widened. Cost. It depends on whether modification will be for the person or public use. If the building is federally subsidized, they, the, um, they would pay the cost for this. Expectations. If it's going to be done by the tenant, you would expect permits to be handled and it done in a workmanlike manner. Restoration and maintenance. Two things there. If you do widening of doors, um, if you do things that really could be considered an improvement, maybe the doorway was very narrow, certainly would not go back and change that. Uh, maintenance. In the exterior, it can be expected that it would be maintained by whoever is generally maintaining the exterior of the building. So if a ramp was put in, they of course would be responsible for snow removal and those type of things. Additional fair housing protections for people with disabilities living in public or subsidized housing. Public or subsidized housing is covered by the FHA and Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. In buildings that receive federal monies, the owner landlord is required to pay for reasonable modifications. Landlords receiving federal assistance where the actual housing um, is receiving federal assistance, public housing and private owners are required to pay for reasonable modifications to the common areas and individual units of tenants with disabilities. The Illinois Safe Homes Act. This is an act that came about um, for survivors of domestic violence, dating violence, stalking, and sexual violence who live in private housing or participate in the Section 8 voucher program. Victims who are tenants who have given their landlord 48 hours to change the locks can change the locks themselves. So in the case of an incident of domestic violence, um, they can notify their landlord. Landlord says cannot get to it in 48 hours. They can be allowed to make that change and then of course give their landlord a key. Another part of this law protects tenants who after surviving a violence or domestic violence or sexual violence, um, they may no longer feel safe. They may feel that they want to end their lease early. Um, part of this uh, also can allow them to break their lease without being liable for unpaid rent after they leave their home. Some of the things that um, you can ask, I mean, you can ask for a police report you can ask, there might be uh, something from the hospital that where they were treated. Those are things you can ask if need be um, to, uh, to be able to do this process and to end their lease early. Sexual harassment and housing. Both men and women are protected and same sex sexual harassment is included. Types of sexual harassment that can occur quid pro quo, 
housing provider denies housing or housing related services as a result of a tenant's refusal of landlord's demands, sexual demands, or interest in dating, uh, hostile environment. If uh, the housing provider engages in a sexual harassing behavior that is severe and pervasive enough to alter the conditions of, house, of the housing environment and result in an intimidating and abusive or hostile environment. Um, this is not something that occurs often, but it does happen. Um, there have been cases where women living with children um, so fearful of losing their housing um, have gone along with situations such as these, but they need not to. The, the law would protect them um, against these type of situations. Now I'll spend a few minutes talking about advertising, starting with prohibited acts. So the law prohibits making, printing, or publishing ads that indicate a preference, limitation, or discrimination based on a protected class. And the protected classes are the ones we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. This law applies to the following. Persons or entities placing ads, such as landlords, home sellers, realtors, lenders, agents, etc., advertising agencies preparing the ads, and newspapers and other media, including directories and multiple listing services, MLS. However, under the Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance, such publishers are not covered under the act. And essentially, it is illegal to make, print, or publish ads indicating preference, limitation, or discrimination based on a protected class. Here are some things to keep in mind when thinking about advertising. Thinking about the content, it's important to focus on the property rather than the potential occupant. In terms of using words and phrases, it's better to avoid words, symbols, and adjectives that suggest any type of preference. And some examples include private, exclusive, and restricted. Human models, if you're going to use a human model in an advertisement, it's better to use ones of people of different backgrounds rather than one group of individuals. Some more things to keep in mind, including the fair housing logo or statement is a nice practice because it informs people who are looking at the advertisement that that is something that is considered. And here's some language that can be included in such a statement. We are pledged to the letter and spirit of US policy for the achievement of equal housing opportunity throughout the nation. We encourage and support an affirmative advertising and marketing program in which there are no barriers to obtaining housing because of race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, or national origin. Affirmative marketing, reaching groups that are not likely to seek housing in a particular market without special outreach could be a useful practice, as well as marketing accessibility because folks who don't see the advertisements being accessible would have a hard time thinking they are, even if they are. So adding that there's accessible units available will be helpful to those seeking such units. In terms of customer service and housing, it's very important in our view that there's consistency in the way business is conducted with rental applicants. For example, giving some people walk-ins and appointments versus others, it's better to just give everyone the opportunity or advertise that that information is available to all. Returning calls, offering advice, answering questions. If you're going to answer questions for some callers, it's best to answer them for all, provided there are questions being asked. In addition, in terms of the representatives being used, if one person is used for a certain unit and that person's not available, that's fine to have another person call back the caller, but it may be better for the original representative to follow up just so the same person's being used for the same unit, as well as whether the staff is selling the property to everyone equally in terms of providing tours or offering services, describing the amenities. It's just best if there's a single dialogue or script or set of words or phrases that's used for each unit by the same person. And then communicating what the application process is like and giving information, it's just best to have a standard script or way of describing the unit and the application process that's used for everyone, no matter who it is. In terms of real estate professionals, real estate agencies, management companies, brokers, leasing agents, and salespeople could be held liable for housing discrimination. It's not just one category. There's a wide range of people who could be held liable under the acts. 
If you're asked by a client or owner not to allow certain classes of individuals to apply, such as people with housing choice vouchers or Section 8 vouchers, or to include a discriminatory statement, then it's something that must be refused because if there isn't a refusal, then both parties will be held liable under the acts or in the ordinances. And finally, real estate professionals are subject to the same penalties as other respondents. And so in a complaint, an individual could be named as well as a company. And so it's important if you're an individual to follow the law as much as you can and follow the law period really, um, so that you're, you are also not liable under these acts and ordinances. Now I'll provide a couple of recent legal developments by the Chicago Commission on Human Relations. In 2017, in the case Arnold v. Hennington, the Commission on Human Relations and the Board of Commissioners found that the respondent landlord discriminated against the complainant when he withdrew an offer to rent the complainant in an apartment after finding out that she would be living in the apartment with her teenage grandson. So this was a case of familial status discrimination and the violation was a refusal to rent after it was revealed that the complainant had a grandson. And the board found that the respondent landlord's action constituted a violation and the damages was in the amount of $1,587 and there was a $1,000 fine. However, under the Chicago Fair Housing Ordinance, prevailing parties can seek attorney's fees. And so a few months later, in November of 2017, the board awarded attorney's fees in the amount of $3,200. So it's just something to keep in mind, in addition to the violations such as uh, recovery of costs and fees and fines, there's also attorney's fees that can be awarded. And usually that's done at a later date after the administrative hearing. Another example is regarding source of income discrimination in which the board found that respondent landlords discriminated against complainant on the basis of his lawful source of income. And this case involved the holder of a HUD VASH, which is the Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing Certificate. And complainant tried to repeatedly rent respondent's house, which was advertised as available, but respondents refused to rent after discovering that he, he was a certificate holder of the VASH certificate. And then following an entry of default, there was a hearing held on damages and emotional distress damages were awarded in the amount of $10,000. And there was a punitive damages award as well as a fine to the city of 1000 And then attorney's fees were also awarded. In terms of the hearing on attorney's fees or petition for attorney's fees, the board awarded 15,000 fees. And so just as a reminder, in addition to the penalties, there's also fees that can be sought by prevailing parties. And that was a hearing that followed up the original hearing in 2017. There are additional decisions that can be accessed on the commission's website. And I provided a link here that you can access in terms of finding the decisions. They are listed by year, so you'll be able to see decisions for 2017 as well as prior years. And you may also call the commission if you have questions about the decisions or how to get information about such decisions. With respect to the Cook County Commission on Human Rights, their decisions are available through their website. And a lot of times their decisions are relating to the investigation as well. So whereas the commission's decisions are more the board of commissioners, which as you saw on the prior slides had to do with hearings, these decisions for the county are more based on the administrative process or the investigation. So it provides a little bit more detail. And the county cases, particularly with respect to source of income are based on the suburban Cook County. So you have the city of Chicago Commission on Human Relations, and then you have the Cook County Commission on Human Rights for suburban Cook County. Now we'll move to the question and answer portion of this presentation, and we hope that there have been some questions that have been submitted through the question portal. We will read the question out loud and then we'll provide a response as best as we're able to do so. So the first question. Uh, what category do emotional support animals fall under? So the question was, what category do emotional support animals fall under? Would you like to share? Sure. Um, it depends on, it, it would be an accommodation if you had a rule saying no pets. Um, it would be, an emotional support would be an accommodation under the um, act that it covers based on disability. Um, if someone has been assigned an emotional support dog, it could be for many reasons. They don't have to tell you the reasons. The 
They can tell you or show you or give you a letter from whoever is treating them that tells they have a need in order to be able to live in the apartment, they must have their emotional support dog with them. Um, some of the cases that would require that could be PTSD, someone who has been a victim of a violent crime. Um, there could be many reasons. Um, the fact is maybe on file, you can say, can you please give me uh, a letter from your doctor that verifies the need for your emotional support dog. It could be if they're seeing a counselor, psychiatrist, anyone in those professions, their, their doctor. Okay, um, I'm so sorry, if you could start that question over again, the audio cut out at the beginning. Okay, I, I apologize. I just learned that the audio went out answering that question, so I'm going to start over. Um, what category does having an emotional support dog? It would be an accommodation and it's depending on the rules. If you have a rule in your building of no pets, this would not be considered a pet because there is an emotional need for having that dog and they, you can ask them if they could supply a letter from whoever's treating them, their doctor, their psychiatrist, to keep that on file um, in their, you know, in the building. Um, so it would fall under under a, a change and you cannot charge them any fees. So say you're building allowed dogs, but you had a monthly fee that you charged. Um, there can be no fees associated with, with that dog because it is an emotional support dog. And that would be the same for any type of service dog because their function is providing a service that would allow the person with the disability to live in their unit. I can't think of anything else that I can tell you about that. Of course, they would have to take care of their dog as anyone would if the dog damaged anything or they would have to keep up with their dog um, just like anyone would have to, whether it's a pet or a service animal. One point I'd like to add is that there may be a possibility that the individual may seek multiple support animal or may need multiple emotional support animals. And for each, there needs to be a certification by a provider uh, like Mary Jo described. So there could be a situation where someone tries to ask for six of them and it would be hard pressed for me to think of an instance where that would be permissible. But for two, it could be possible that that might be needed. It just depends on the, the type of injury. And, and it's just better to not be in the business of, of questioning someone's disability. It's more just verifying the need for such an animal. And additionally, something to keep in mind is if the building has a no pets policy and there are there's an emotional support animal request, there cannot be a restriction on the basis of that animal. So for example, if someone says, oh, well, you can have the emotional support animal, but only on the first floor, that would not, that would not pass muster under the, the ordinance. So there needs to be documentation that's written, but they cannot be treated differently from others who do not have emotional support animals. I just wanted to add one thing so there's no confusion, though, about certification. There is not a program that certifies emotional support animals that they can show you a document. The only thing that you can require from them, though, is the letter um, from whoever is treating them based on that, that need. So now we'll take the second question. Um, can you please clarify which of these policies and acts apply to private owners, such as owner-occupied buildings of less than five units? So the, the question is, which of these acts apply to owner-occupied buildings of less than five units? So we, we stated at the beginning that it applies to most housing providers, and so there are some exceptions. And that is listed, those are listed in the actual acts. I don't have the exact language in front of me. I can provide an answer to the person who asked this question if you email us directly. I, I'm sorry, I don't have the answer right in front of me, but there are certain types of dwellings that are exempt. That is true. I just have to locate it. So I will, I'm sorry if I can't provide that during this webinar, but I can definitely provide the answer to the person who asked the question. So if you could please email email us at the end, we will provide that answer. Thank you. So now we'll move on to the next question. Um, what do you do when a CHA voucher holder has occupants living in the unit that are not in the lease or on the voucher and are disrupting other tenants? 
So a question is what to do if someone is a voucher tenant and they have people living in or dwelling in living in the unit who are not on the lease and who are, I think the phrasing was being disruptive or otherwise being engaged. So my answer to that is, of course, under landlord tenant law, which this isn't a presentation about landlord tenant law, it's about fair housing, but this is a related question. The contract that the lease that, that's offered is for certain individuals to reside in the unit and there may be policies for guests. And so it really would be based on case by case as to what the guest policy is. Provided that the person is in the terms of the lease, that's one thing. However, if there is a violation, whether it's a guest policy or just having people residing there, it would be a recommendation on our end that there be a discussion about it rather than just sending a 30 day notice, just to give the opportunity for the person residing in the unit, the leaseholder to either have those people be relocated or, or seek to amend the lease or otherwise discuss that situation. Sometimes there, there's concerns whether if there's a 30 day notice issued to a tenant without some type of process that there could be concerns that it was because of the voucher status, even if it wasn't, it just would be best to engage in some type of interactive dialogue where there's a question about the people living there and there might be an explanation and hopefully there can be a resolution outside of a 30 day notice. Now we'll move on to the next question. Um, do you th are there any laws protecting landlords? And do you think that the landlords are at the mercy of the renter and the law? I'll take a stab. Um, do you want to repeat the question? Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Could you repeat it one time? You don't time? have to repeat it. We can do it. Okay. Oh, okay, great. We, right. we, so we, I hope everyone heard the question, but Mary Jo will answer it. Well, first of all, when you do sign, when you have a lease um, that protects kind of both sides, what, what is expected on the part of both. And the landlord uh, tenant law, it does lay out what are responsibilities of the landlord, what are responsibilities of the tenant. Um, the tenant must abide by your lease. Otherwise you can take action, either ask to cure the situation or to um, and if they can't, then you can proceed to, to terminate a, a, ten, a tenant. Um, I think the power of, of uh, is really more with the landlord than rather the tenant. But yes, I know that there are situations um, that do occur. The important thing is that you follow the law if you are going to uh, terminate someone, follow the law as far as documenting what occurred, showing how you worked with the tenant. Um, anything you'd like to add to that, Barbara? No, I, I think the, the issue here is that the what we've provided today is an overview of facts that relate to these fair housing laws. But at the same time, like I said, this isn't a landlord tenant law presentation, but there are extensive ordinances and requirements under each jurisdiction for landlord tenant law, which provides for the protection of landlords in the event of a contract violation, mm -hmm. which would result in the eviction process. But that isn't something that we're, we're covering today. So we'll hear the next question. Um, if a person's tenancy is reinstated as a reasonable accommodation for alcohol recovery, and management observes this tenant under the influence or drinking, can the landlord lawfully move forward with eviction without offering additional time for recovery? You wanna start with that one then I'll... Well, the law protecting someone um, if they have alcohol or drug addiction is just that if they are in recovery. So say for instance, in the decision-making process, when you're making a decision of whether you're gonna to rent to someone, if you see that they have been, um, um, somehow it shows that they have been just left treatment, to make a decision not to rent to them based on the fact that they had treatment, but they are no longer um, using drugs or no longer drinking, um, they, you cannot refuse them. Now, we're saying that during their tenancy, um, you see that they are 
drinking or you feel they are using drugs, um, I would say document that. Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure how to answer that if, that, if that situation is changing. I guess you would see, are they violating any laws? Are they violating any part of their lease? Is it because you're getting complaints based on this? I mean, that on itself is what you might be able to look at to make changes or to decide to not to rent to someone is, is because of difficulties in the building or complaints. I think it would have to do more with that. What are the actions rather than I think they may be, um, what are the actual um, actions that are occurring that, that is causing an issue with the tenant? Yes, I would agree with that because it, I don't think landlords, I don't think any housing provider wants to be in the business of determining whether someone is recovering or not from an addiction to a substance or is disabled, right? And so what the landlord can do with the power that the landlord has is the contract, right? The lease and the terms in the lease and provisions in the ordinances that apply to the dwelling. So public intoxication, the other violations of that sort can be documented and that is defense in an eviction action because that individual violated the terms of the lease or was violating ordinances that in most standard leases, as far as I understand, if you violate laws, you can be evicted. And so that's something to keep in mind. It's just, it's better not to be in the business of determining whether someone's truly recovered or is a lapse recovery or that's just going down a road that might be problematic. We'll read the next question. Do hoarders fall under protected status of any sort? Hoarders? So when I hear that, I, I am not aware, so I'm not a doctor, so I'm not aware whether a person who is a hoarder has a disability. That could be the case, but without documentation, remember disability, it, it's regarded as, or perception is also part of it. So it kind of goes back to the prior question. If the hoarding is resulting in pest infestation or other types of deterioration of conditions in the unit that is affecting the property and violating the terms of the lease, then that can be acted upon. If someone just likes to stack paper and things, it's that person's prerogative, unless there's damage to the property or other violations of the landlord tenant ordinance or the terms of the lease. It's just hard, again, to be in the business of determining whether that person has an issue or not or knowing whether to act. But if there is an action being taken by the individual that's causing destruction or deterioration or maintenance issues or, or is affecting other tenants' enjoyment of the property or otherwise violating the terms of the lease, and that can be acted upon. And the only thing I would add to that is to allow time for it to be cured. Um, it, uh, hoarding is a serious issue. I think uh, it's, it is very difficult to overcome that. Um, I think to be straightforward and, and, and also it depends on a person's perception to what some people may consider hoarding um, it may not be the same for the next person. Um, there may be someone who hoards, but they hoard very neatly and in boxes or however. Um, but definitely if it is something that's more extreme to at least allow them the time to either cure the situation, explain what, what the issues are that the hoarding is causing, and then maybe go from there to see that they at least have an opportunity to correct it or to make changes. So read the next question. Uh, that was our last content question. Do you have a question about the slides? Okay, uh, so we still have a couple more minutes. So if anyone has another question you'd like to type in, please feel free to do so in the question section of the webinar. In terms of the slides, we will be having the opportunity to make those available through ILEO, Illinois Legal Aid Online's website, as well as a recording of this presentation. So if you were not able to take all the notes you'd like to, or if you'd like to look back and review our answers to some of the questions or some of the categories, you can refer back to ILEO and there will be a link to this presentation that you can view on a later date. And so if there are no other questions, oh, there might be one other questions that we'll, we'll review. 
rents. Um, if I have a property for rent that would require extensive repairs um, and monetary costs that would not be done for a market rate te tenant, is the landlord required to do these repairs to allow CHA voucher holder to lease and pass inspection? Right, so thank you for this question about making repairs in order to pass inspection. So the law provides that if, so it, it's just something that is a reality in, in the law. If a person with a voucher seeks to apply for a unit and that person is denied because they are a voucher holder, that is a violation of the local ordinances, even if it costs money to make repairs to pass inspection. Of course, if there are substantial repairs that would need to be made and the building is in a state or condition that it would cost tens of thousands of dollars, something really high and that the landlord can't afford, that is something that would be taken into consideration. However, absent documentation of that, for example, going through the inspection and identifying the costs and having real proof of that being a high burden or expense, that would be a violation to simply deny the opportunity for a person with a voucher or other source of income to rent the unit. So, so in, order, in other words, there would need to be the process where the individual applies and then there's an inspection and if the inspection reveals substantial repairs, that would be a different situation. But the process, in our view, still needs to occur in order to identify what those expenses are. And it actually might be helpful because mm -hmm. you can find out what, what is wrong and, and who knows if the property is sold, there will need to be an inspection anyway. So it could be useful. It's just not going through it in the first place. That would be presumably a violation of the local ordinances. Uh, are there any other questions? Can I verify or ask CHA Section 8 about the CHA Section 8 voucher amount before viewing uh, the property? Right. So we've gotten this question before about the verifying the amount. So my understanding of the process, and I don't work for CHA, I'm not a CHA representative, I'm an advocate on, on these issues, is that when an individual approaches a landlord about a unit and has a voucher, declares that he or she has a voucher, the steps are as follows. Uh, an RTA packet is completed, a uh, request for tenancy approval is completed by the owner or the landlord, that goes to CHA, and then an inspection is completed to verify that the unit is, unit is available. Following that is the rent determination, which is done between the landlord and CHA. That is my understanding of the process, and I would recommend that you contact CHA, the Housing Authority, and, or go on their website. They have a lot of resources and a very extensive frequently asked questions section that I believe that would be covered under that section. But I can't answer it because I don't work for CHA. Are there any other questions? When using income as a determining factor in screening, um, and using a three times the rent income rule for market rate tenants, how do I apply that to a CHA voucher holder? Right, so what I was saying before is that that rule cannot be applied to voucher holders because if it were for rent that is in excess of certain amounts, that would make it virtually impossible for voucher holders to rent the unit. So instead, what a lot of landlords do is only apply the portion that the voucher holder is required to pay. Now, in, in respect to the previous question, which asked if you can find that out, when applying the policy, that may then be an appropriate opportunity to ask the individual what portion they expect to pay because they most likely will know, although it's not certain. Again, I don't work for CHA, so I can't provide a precise answer. But in order to apply that policy, it cannot be the, the rate of the market rate of the unit or else it would prohibit voucher holders from being uh, able to apply for the unit. And I might add that it may well be they're only responsible for one third of whatever income they do take. So they would fall into one third, but it's of the income that they would make. And then the voucher would make up the difference. So just as an example, if a unit costs $1,000 and the tenant portion is 300, they would only have to make 900 a month to qualify, not 3,000 a month. Any other questions? Um, does Chicago Lawyers Committee take case, uh, cases for tenants and landlords? The Chicago Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, we investigate cases involving discrimination. 
at this time, we are taking certain criteria for cases. And so uh, if you'd like to follow up, if you have an issue, we can help provide a proper referral, uh, but we cannot comment on the types of cases we take at, at the moment. I will say, typically, we have represented in the past, we've represented tenants and home buyers and prospective tenants and prospective home buyers uh, at the same time, depending on the situation. It, maybe more broad than that. It, so if you have a question, please contact us uh, separately. Any other questions? No. Okay, well, seeing that there are no more questions in the question field, we would like to thank everyone for your time today participating in this webinar. We enjoyed providing the information and if you have any additional questions, you may reach us at the following information. Let me just of that slide. Oh, as a reminder, this is an educational purposes only presentation. And although I'm an attorney speaking on these subjects, it, this is not a substitute for legal advice. So we would recommend if you have questions in particular about your situation, please contact an attorney in the Chicago area or who uh, provides legal services to Chicago housing providers. And here is our uh, email address. We have an info at tlccrul.org address. If you have any questions, please send them to that address and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you all for your time and attention and have a great day. Thank you very much. Goodbye.